word on this. Now we'll go back, share our screen. All right, now we're recording. And again, this is part, as you know from the previous ones, it's a partial lecture, but often a lot of Q and A. And also just, a, I enjoy a free flowing conversational style of teaching more than a you, I impart all my wisdom to you style. So again, today, the Book of Common Prayer, and actually a lot of what we'll talk about pushes back to topics that we've already went through, like the sacraments were the class last time, and we'll look at where we'd find them in the Book of Common Prayer, and we also to look and say, well, what does, why is it important? Why do we need to know all this stuff? Well, the main reason you want to know about the Book of Common Prayer is because if somebody says, what do you Episcopalians actually believe? Well, you'd say, let me hear, I can't, I can't tell you in five minutes or less, but let me hand you this book. Because if you want to know what Episcopalians believe about marriage, what do we believe about baptism? What do we believe about communion? What do we believe about ordination? What do we believe about scriptures? I it can't get like really nitpicky to say, what do you believe about student debt reduction? or anything like that, that's that's a different ball game. You have to go read general convention resolutions. But in terms of theological questions and what we are trying to say, the Book of Common Prayer is meant to do that. And the kind of, for Giovanni, who's gonna be taking Latin there up at St. Joe's, lex orande, lex credende. What the church prays is what the church believes. So, and pressure uh, teacher on that first day in Latin with that one. So anyway, going back, the other thing about the Book of Common Prayer is, does anybody happen to know off the top of your head when the first Book of Common Prayer ever was? Take a Somewhere in the mid to, fifth, mid to late 1500s during the Tudor era? That would be correct. 1549 was the first attempt at a Book of Common Prayer in the in England. Now the Book of Common Prayer flows out of the, the Church of England to which we are the American branch of it is the originators of common prayer. So as if you go around the globe, no matter if the British Empire ever set foot somewhere, the Book of Common Prayer is now there. It went with all all of Britain's empire building, the church followed along. So that's why we talk about the Anglican communion. So you can go anywhere, almost in any country and the, on the globe and find an Anglican church somewhere. And they all have a book of common prayer that is based off of the pr prayer book in England. Now, the last prayer book that England really did until recently was from 1662. So they kept adapting it and adapting it. And as I said, if you go to New Zealand, they have their own version of the Book of Common Prayer. Australia has its own. The places in Africa have their own. Even Scotland, right on to, in Great Britain, has its own version. But Generally speaking, the format's the same. What it tries to cover is the same, but it gets a localized context. So when, as we know, America is third, one of the, was a colony of England at first. And so along with the, not, the pilgrims were not Anglicans, of course, but when the Anglicans came over and started helping develop the colonies, they brought the Church of England right with them. And they brought their little 1662 prayer book. And of course, we know something happened between 1662 and when the first American prayer book happened in 1789. Anybody want to guess what that was? This one's an easy one, Erica. The revolution. The revolution, the revolution. <laughs> exactly, yes. The American revolution caused a problem for the Church of England here in America. Because of course, all the priests were from Britain. And when they were ordained by the rites in the Book of Common Prayer for the Church of England, 
they swore allegiance to the crown. So a lot of the clergy were all Tories, if you know your American history terms. So they, when the Revolutionary War caused a bit of a havoc, but there were still some loyalists here in, in the church that stayed around and tried to keep it floating, but they lost their connection to the empire for obvious reasons. And it, you didn't want to go and say, St. Luke's the Church of England church. That would not really do real well right after the American Revolution. So around 1789, they got together, formed the church. And we'll look a little deeper into that history in September. But the first prayer book that they had to come up with was published in 1789. Then from there, they had that book right up to about 1892. And then, you know, scholars get together and then what's called general convention votes on it, ratifies it and says, this is now the book you must use. And then from 1892, they had about almost 30 years of no new prayer book until 1928. And that book, I can remember that book. And it's still, as a matter of fact, I have one sitting right here on my desk. And literally the ones in the pews were about this size, really tiny. But when the new, the prayer book that we currently use, which some people say the new prayer book, which is now almost 50 years old. So it's, it's hardly new. But there are people that will fondly remember this book and say this was the real prayer book. But there are other people who say, no, the real prayer book was 1662. And if you love prayer books, it's kind of neat to have a copy of each. But if you're really going to be an Episcopalian in the 21st century, at least for the moment, you want to have the one that's sitting in your pew. And I always tell folks, if you're looking for a good confirmation present, having a book of common prayer of your own is a wonderful gift. I've got probably two different copies. I've got about four copies of my own, but I still have the one that was given to me at confirmation. And there was a nice certificate that the bishop signed in the front of it. But when this book flipped out, was switched out for this one, uh, my dad, who was the rector here at the time, knew that this book still mattered to a lot of people. So what he said was, take it home for your personal devotions. And so lots of people, old timers at St. Luke's, have a copy of this book because they said, please take it home. We won't be using it anymore in worship, but we know it still speaks to your heart, brings you closer to God. And if you have ever gone to an eight o'clock service here, the language of the 28 prayer book is all what we call right one in the 79 prayer book. There's a lot of these and thou's, a lot of Elizabethan English, big words like vouchsafe that nobody knows what it means, but it sounds really impressive. But there, but the in the 70s, as they were looking to revise this prayer book, my dad's generation of priests fought hard for a lot of the changes that happened in the prayer book. Because if, what I've said about, I don't know if I've said this about the Episcopal Church, but if you ever remember the Donnie and Marie show, which was a variety show in the 70s, they, their opening theme was, we're a little bit country, we're a little bit rock and roll. And... The Episcopal Church is a little bit Protestant and a little bit Catholic. You, for those who are XRCs, you say, no, you're a heck of a lot more Catholic than any Protestant church I know. And yet, we're not as Catholic as a Roman Catholic by any stretch of the imagination. But the more Catholic Episcopalians won the war of prayer book revision. So that's why when you come to a church service these days, you're like, well, that seems an awful lot like what I remember if you're a former Roman Catholic, mm -hmm. because the Catholic side got the stuff in in the prayer book that they wanted. Eucharist became the principal act of worship. When my, when for many Episcopalians, that was a new invention. Morning prayer was what you did most Sundays. So let's take a look at, as I say, history of prayer books are always interesting. They 
don't intend to change much. Go ahead, Dottie. Question? Uh, uh, yeah, I do have a question. If my history uh, doesn't fail me, if it was my understanding that Elizabeth the first tried to um, put together both sides to keep both the the Catholics and the Protestants happy with the Anglican Church. Yeah, we called Via Media, which. I mean, she's the queen at the time, so she's the head of it. She wasn't really a liturgy person, but the archbishops that she was working with, mm -hmm. she's, as again, she followed, she's one of Henry VIII's daughters. Mm -hmm. Henry VIII's first daughter, Mary Queen of Scots. As we remember, Henry takes the epistle. He was very Roman Catholic. Henry creates the Church of England, which he says is just the Roman Catholic Church in England without the Pope having any authority because it's about property not really about theology. And his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, was a devout Roman Catholic, and Mary was their child. And so when Henry died, his son was the first one, but he was too young to really know so, stuff. So the religious leaders who were fighting this stuff, he didn't really care. And Mary gets the throne, and she cares. Protest, the Protestant side of stuff took it on the chin. And then... Elizabeth well, they called Bloody Mary, wasn't it? Yeah. And then Elizabeth comes in and says, ah, well, let's let's have a little less bloodshed. Let's find where that sweet spot is. Mm -hmm. And there, and that's really where the Church of England kind of gets finds its footing, so to speak. But throughout all that kind of history, again, we get to, so we get to 1979 in the early 70s here in the Episcopal Church when I was growing up. There had these, what they were calling prayer book um, study publications where you could see what the new rites might look like. And at St. Luke's, the eight and, eight and 11 a.m. service were using the old prayer book and we're in the church that we all go to now. But the 915 service, which had you know 200 people at it, was in the auditorium where we have coffee hour now and was using those trial liturgies, because my dad was into that. But the trial liturgies ultimately lead to this prayer book. And it's so far, as I said, it's coming up on almost 50 years of use. And there are people who are currently still having arguments about whether we need a whole brand new prayer book or whether we need to just add supplemental stuff and then it becomes about authority to use. So it's, there's a lot of different questions at stake, but at the moment, the 79 is what we have. And those harder questions I leave to my friend, Kevin Maroney and his pals and say, just tell me when you've changed something and I'll come along for the ride. So if you had one at your own, and by the way, you don't even have, I like happen to like holding a copy of a book in my hands. That's why I, I don't read on a tablet. I like to go to the library. I just happen to like the sensation of feeling a book in my hands. But you can actually go to the site that I've pulled up and I'm sharing the screen for, BCP Online. It's free and has everything you would need. So if you didn't want to buy a hard copy, you could actually download this and have it on your computer. You can get it on your smartphone. And a lot of people have those. But the first part I want to, I say, yeah, it's your nice table of contents tells you where everything is if you're looking for it. Of course, when you're on a computer, it's just got links. So the first link that they want you to see is sort of a calendar of the church year, and which will point out not only the seasons, but also specific saint days. So if we go to it, it tells us about principal feasts. So these are the ones you can't mess with you're not supposed to mess with. Easter Day, Ascension Day, Pentecost, Trinity Sunday, All Saints, Christmas Day, not Eve, by the way, Day, and the Feast of the Epiphany. So if they happen to show up on a Sunday, like if November 1st happens to be a Sunday, you celebrate All Saints Day. You don't celebrate whatever Pentecost Day it is. And it also allows... For all saints only, you're allowed to move it. So I, like this for this year, we'll be singing all the saint songs on about November 
the 6th. Christmas, you know, we know when Christmas happens and it's always a mess when Christmas day is a Sunday or <laughs> Christmas Eve is a Saturday. Or when Christmas Eve is a Sunday, it's the worst day because you've got to finish Advent before you can start Christmas. They don't let you flip January 6th around, but we often play with it because we want to sing the songs about the kings. And Trinity, these three, Ascension, Pentecost, and Trinity, all come off of whenever Easter is. And we'll get to how do you know when Easter is going to be a little later. So then you have some other Sundays that if they have, if these days happen to fall on a Sunday, you can um, celebrate those days. Holy Name, which is January 1st, Presentation, which is February 2nd, and Transfiguration, which is August 6th. And as it says, here's a piece of the dedication of a church. Like when we celebrate St. Luke's Day, it's not because we're going to have a carnival. It's because that's our patronal feast day. But we can move the, the Sunday before, and we historically have been doing that. That's when we honor our nonagenarians. And this time it's when the bishop happens to be coming. Everything else, though, from the calendar has to happen on the day that it's supposed to happen, unless it's your saint day. Ash Wednesday and Good Friday all come based on when Easter is and are historically fast days, meaning that. You're supposed to not eat, but again, as I talk about spiritual disciplines, um, if not eating is not going to bring you closer to God, it's not really doing you much good. So I've never been somebody who's been able to fast because I just get a headache and I'm reminded that I'm hungry. So it defeats the whole purpose as far as I can tell. So, But there may be other ways of doing it. So the calendar itself, anybody got a birthday in January? Or, when's your birthday in January? What day? 27. 27? All right. So if if your parents were devout Episcopalians and you happen to be a boy, you could they could have named you John Chrysostom. You could find your saint. I always think this fun thing I used to do with the young when I had mostly sixth graders that say, tell me your birthday. Let's see if you have a saint day. And did your parents name you correctly? Most of the time, no. Anybody, so the funny thing with this is I tell my son, Peter, that he acts, if his father had been paying attention to this line of thinking at the time, he could have been either Timothy or Titus. He said he would have preferred Timothy. He's told me that. He said Peter had all kinds of problems growing up and nobody would want to be Titus. That has other playground problems attached to it. All right, anybody I didn't realize else? Fabian was that important. Oh, yeah. And the nice thing about all of these saint days is if you get another book, you can read the whole history of it. The prayer book doesn't give you the nice histories, but there is a book called Lesser Feasts and Fasts. And how do I know if something's a lesser feast and fast? If it's in bold face, then it's a major feast of the church. If it's in smaller font or not bold face then it's a lesser feast and sometimes we share lesser feast days with roman catholics but there obviously comes a point in our history where we don't share the same saints but the major one the major saint days are going to be pretty universal and another thing about january the date between the 18th and the 25th anybody happen to know what that week is called All right. What the answer to that one is, is the week of prayer for Christian unity happens between the confession of St. Peter and the conversion of St. Paul. So many churches sometimes will do pulpit exchanges so that I might have gone to a Methodist church and a Methodist pastor might have come here just to celebrate this attempt at Christian unity. How about anybody got a February birth? All right, we'll just whip up and down. Dottie, what's your birthday? May 9th. When? May 9th. May 9th. Let's see if Dottie gets a saint on her birthday. Yes, yes. Gregory of Nazianzus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, again? Well, 
if I was a boy, I could have been Theodore. <laughs> okay. Erica, how about you? April 30th. April. Doesn't look good. Nope, you get a blank day. <laughs> oh, right. poor oh, Erica. Uh, okay. That might have been a good thing, Erica. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Susan, how about you? Unmute yourself so we can hear. Still muted. There you go. That's November. November, all right. What day in November? Ninth. Ninth? Ah, another blank. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. And I'm sure you know yours without even looking. What did what do you have? I have nothing. I have my blank too. If it's any constellation to anybody. The, there was a Saint Ed day at one time. I don't know where it went. Oh. Uh -huh. And help me again. I, I remember, especially for those who haven't always been here. The man in the back room, my other, our buddy, Susan's buddy. Tell me then uh, introduce yourself again to everybody else. You. March 3rd. Ron? March okay. 3rd. Okay. March 3rd. All right. Yep. Let's see if we have one on March 3rd. Oh, you are John or Charles Wesley, the, the ah, founder priest who founded Methodism. <laughs> right. Okay. Who in the Figuera household has not put up a birthday yet? Um, my birthday is June 3rd. June 3rd, let's see. Ah, you're the martyrs of Uganda. I don't think that would be a good name to run around with. <laughs> <laughs> that would have caused playground problems <laughs> as well. Now look at the dates though again. So if you go just okay. above it, the martyrs of Lyons, 177. The martyrs of Uganda, 1886. Great, wow. So we can say that we're pretty sure the martyrs of Uganda were probably Anglican. Hmm. Uh, oh, can you do Fe uh, February 15th is John's birthday? All right. Let's see if John gets a winner. Thomas Bray, priest and missionary. Again, he, <laughs> a good Anglican because, again, 1730. So we know it's Church of England at least. All right. Jenny, did you throw a date out? Uh, June 5th. June 5th. All right. It said something about Germany, but I couldn't make Bo it out. Boniface, Archbishop Boniface. of Men's. Missionary to Germany and Mark and Mark, 754. So, so if that's most of my Boniface, heritage, yeah, yeah, most of my heritage is German. So, that's, okay. kind so of... that's a good name, then. Hmm. And my let's see, as I said, I'm nothing. Let's see if my wife <laughs> Gail gets St. Bede, which we actually Maybe. named we named a cat after one of our cats, Bede, <laughs> the venerable Bede. I don't know if it was born in May. 25th, how about my grandson, Owen? 23rd, no, Pete, they didn't get anything. That's why he's Owen. All right, and that's it. Uh, I want to ask you a question. Yeah. Uh, my last name is King. K-I-N-G. K-I-N-G? Yes. Okay. Uh, that's radio, isn't it? I think. I'm how joking, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Okay. So again, we got this calendar and it's kind of, and it's just sort of fun if you're trying to say, well, like my son, Michael, who was born October 11th, we thought he was coming September 29th. That's why he's Michael. Okay. He, and the patron saint of the church I was at at that time was Michael. <laughs> George is actually the important name for him, but Michael is, he was got that because of then. Then it gives us how the seasons roll. Now, we know our seasons, right? We got Advent being the first season of the church year. So when I say Happy New Year in December or late November, it's because the new church year has started. And we know in Advent, there are four Sundays. We know that because of the four candles and an Advent wreath. There is a movement right now that my friend Phil is a part of trying to make Advent a seven week season, starting in mm -hmm. right after All Saints. And while I understand his logic, I'm like, again, until the church changes its teaching, I'm not on board. But he's he thinks that Advent 
is to people see it as a mini Lent and it's really not that. They lose sight of the beauty of it because we're all really focused on Christmas. And, but if we could make the season longer, that maybe the oomph of it would happen. And he says that if you look at the readings, they're very much in an Advent theme going all the way through Christ the King Sunday, which is the last Sunday before he hit Advent. And Christmas season, how long is Christmas season, folks? 12 days. 12 days, right. And it goes from the 25th to January 6th. Yes. Right, so... When mm -hmm. everybody, after the 25th, if people refuse to wish you a Merry Christmas, tell them they're crazy. <laughs> it's still Christmas. But, and we're, we're, of course, fighting a very different battle with everybody wants to say Merry Christmas well before December 25th. <laughs> but it's not, it's not a fight worth having. I mean, but if you're going to really want to live the seasons, Advent is a wonderful season to really, for a household to pay attention to. There's a lot of stuff that can be done to that builds the momentum towards Christmas. Then in then of course Epiphany comes, it's not just a day, it's a whole season, but it's a strange season because how long it lasts depends on when Easter is. Because you have Easter has to happen on a specific Sunday, but if it's late in the year, that means you're going to get a lot a lot of eight Sundays of Epiphany. If it's earlier in the spring, you might only get six. And it has a few, like the ones in the season that are important, you celebrate Jesus's baptism the first Sunday after the sixth. And at the last one, you actually read the transfiguration lessons. And Epiphany, it's colors. Uh, let's do colors real quick. Advent can be either blue or purple. We happen to use blue here. Christmas is always white. Epiphany through the baptism of the, our Lord is white and then it goes green. Then we get to Lent and Lent starts with Ash Wednesday and goes for five full Sundays. Lent's color tends to be purple. It can mm -hmm. also be what's called Lenten array, which is sort of a sackcloth color. Depends on how hip you wanna be. We didn't, we're not hip. <laughs> and somebody paid good money for a great purple set. So we're sticking with that. Then we get the shortest church season of the year, Holy Week, which of course starts on Palm Sunday and goes all the way through Holy Saturday. And as you know, if you've been paying attention, we celebrate every single day of Holy Week here. Um, and Wednesday through Friday are the really cool days of it, but the other days, ha if you're keeping Holy Week, it's actually can be quite meaningful. And then you have Easter season, which starts that Saturday night before Easter day. You have Easter day. So you, if somebody says to you, happy Easter Sunday, they're wrong. Every Sunday is technically an Easter Sunday. You're celebrating the resurrection but there's a specific Easter day. So somebody says, I'm here in church, I'm all dolled up. All, look at how full the church is on Easter Sunday. Mm -hmm. no. Easter day, it's pretty full, but every day, every Sunday is, is, East, is a mini Easter. And again, there's definitely seven Sundays in Easter with Ascension Day and Pentecost being the things that bring the close to the season. Then you have Pentecost, which can start depending on when Easter was, it can be very early or mid-May to early June. And how many, where you start depends on what day Trinity Sunday is, but that's based on when Easter was. And then tells us about the holy days that were the bold faced ones when we were looking directly at the calendar. And Independence Day is a church day in the Episcopal Church, as is Thanksgiving. So we have serve, there are liturgies that we could do on those days. Okay, now, then what service, what service are most of you familiar with? Out of all the services in this book, which one do, should all of you know? 
at least from experience. Do you mean the mass? Like the, yes, the Holy Eucharist. The that, yep, that's the one. The modern version. Yeah, the modern version. But if you ever if you ever bump into me on Facebook Mondays through Thursdays at either nine noon, five o'clock or eight forty-five. We do what's called the daily offices. The daily offices, there are two, you have again, right one and right two for morning and evening prayer. And then they do have the service for noonday, the service of evening, and they have what's called concerning a service of worship in the evening. So it gives you an outline of how to do it if you want to tinker with it. Compline, which is a beautiful way to close your day if you're not doing it. Now, if you're like, man, those services seem long. 15 minutes is an awful long time to pray. And if you're, or if you're wanting to start a little slower and bring yourself into getting to the bigger, longer services, they have what's called daily devotions for individuals and families. Now, I want to take a look at that because that's a piece of the prayer book not everybody knows about. So it gives you, and it's literally one page long. So if you were looking to, how could I start a good prayer rhythm? And I'm not quite ready to join you for morning prayer yet, or I don't have that much time to give. Every morning you could just do this, which gives you a Psalm to say, a specific reading, invites you just into a place of silence to pray. You can pray and say the Lord's prayer, which they don't give you because they figure you've got it memorized. And then you have a prayer at the end of it. And then you close it with a collect. Same thing at noon, same thing in the early evening, and some same thing at the close of the day. So again, I'd invite you, if you're wanting to find that rhythm, here's a section of the prayer book that very few people even know exists. But it works. You, it's worth Can you give the time for that again? Ed? Say that again? Uh, what was the, because I would like to do that. I'd like to know where to find that. Okay, it's called the Daily Devotions. And they begin on page 137. And it's right after the daily offices. But again, really easy to do. And once you get that rhythm, then you it's sort of like exercising. You know, you don't start off by doing 100 pound bench presses. You start with maybe five in each arm and you work your way up. And prayer can be a lot like that. But the people who created this book said, here's a good way to start. And it does follow those four times a day praying. So if you think about it, our Muslim brothers and sisters have very specific times of prayer. You may have noticed them that they, the, when it's whatever the exact time is, they bring out their prayer rugs. You see them in airports or in parks at a very specific time. The Episcopal Church doesn't tell you what time to do it. It gives you a time frame. So morning could be from whenever you get up to lunch. Noon days, sort of whenever you might be eating lunch. Early evening, that's sort of, okay, your commute home to, to when you're ready to go to bed. And at the close of the day is pretty much that, when you're about ready to call it a night. Again, highly recommend that part. And the Great Litany, uh, the only reason you'd know about the Great, you've all, if you've been here the first Sunday of Lent, you've experienced the Great Litany. It is a never ending prayer. It just keeps going. And the first time I'd ever experienced it was in college and we were all on our knees for the entire thing. Mm. And I was like, wow, this prayer is not ending anytime soon, is it? Yeah, but, but you, it was easier to kneel in college. <laughs> yeah. And the first time I then saw, second time I saw it, it was being done in procession at a cathedral and the dynamic of it changed for me because there was movement, there was something happening and I sort of fell in love with it, but I only do it once a year. <laughs> then the colics, where do you see the, the, you should know the colics because we pray them every Sunday. Mm -hmm. As soon as we've really gotten this church service started before the readings begin, we have the colics. When they say traditional or contemporary, that's just right one, right two. But each Sunday of the church year, in addition to every feast day, has a specific collect. And sometimes, though not often, 
I thought, contemplated preaching about the collect. And, but I don't know how many of you ever really pay attention to the collect or do you just say amen because it's time to say amen. Everybody else is doing it and you don't want to be embarrassed. Can you show us what it is? Because I'm not sure okay. I recognize right. it by name. Sure. Let's look at, so when we've, we've processed into the church, we've sang that first hymn, we've sang the glory to God in the highest. And then I go, the Lord be with you. And everybody says, and also with you. And I say, let us pray. And then for instance, where's the one we just said? Let's see if I can find it fast. This past Sunday, which would have been, oh, good. They're being nice to making it the, here, we prayed the prayer for proper 16. It was Pentecost 11, but it was the clo Sunday closest to August 24th. So I would said, grant, O merciful God, that your church being gathered together in unity by your Holy Spirit may show forth your power among all peoples to the glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. And they have one every single Sunday has a different one. So it, it repeats every year. But depending on what Sunday it is, you'll always hear the same collect. And a collect is just a fancy name for a prayer. Mm -hmm. Then we get the proper liturgies for the special days. So if you've ever learned, well, what's he going to do on Ash Wednesday? Besides put ashes on her head. The whole service is of Ash Wednesday is laid out. There's not a whole lot for me to think about. Tells me what the readings will be, shows me, gives me things like this. But let's take a look at this page for instance. Notice that this this part right here where I'm set, sending my cursor part that looks why that's in italics. When you're looking at a prayer book, anything in italics are what are called rubrics. Rubrics are guide tells you what you should be doing or or what the choices are. So like here it says, if ashes are to be imposed, the celebrant, i.e.g. I, me, says the following prayer. But if you're not doing ashes, if you're not imposing ashes, you don't say this prayer. And it tells me what the what I'm supposed to say. So I don't have to make things up when I put ashes on your forehead. And then sometimes the rubrics will say, you may do this or you may not. It tell, if you've been wondering, when am I supposed to talk? If the prayer book says the celebrant and the people together. And that's when. You're supposed to talk. If it says the <laughs> celebrant continues, you're not supposed to talk. Unless it's in italics again. Then you're talking. So the prayer book lays out your lines for you. Shows you when you're <laughs> supposed to speak when you're not supposed to speak and go through it. So Ash Wednesday is the first kind of weird, not Sunday liturgy that they have. Then it gives you Palm Sunday, which if you've been, as you know, here we all, Palm Sunday is actually very short because it's literally what we do in the auditorium before we go into the church. So when we're getting all the palms and we're singing all glory, laud and honor, and blessing the palms and walking around inside the church if it's raining or outside if it's not. That's Palm Sunday. And the liturgy is very short. You read a gospel, you say a prayer, you bless the palms, and then you move. But the Eucharist itself is actually called Passion Sunday because we read the Passion Gospel. So the part where everybody, lots of people have roles, and here at 10 o'clock especially, the kids get to read. Giovanni's done it many times. And probably he's getting closer and closer to getting to be the narrator as he gets older and older. And there are less people old. He'll be one of the older kids sooner rather than later. And of course, Erica's sons in a few years, hopefully they'll be ready to step up and read. I'm sure they probably can read it, almost read at this point. But there'll be a point. Where, yeah, okay. Five and a half. Well, you never this year. So big changes yeah. in the next year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then it gives us also, you know, the liturgy for Monday, Thursday, the liturgy for Good Friday, and the liturgy for Holy Saturday, which again, Holy Saturday is another very short service that very few people come to because it happens, 
in the morning, you're sort of that part period where the Bible talks about Jesus being in the tomb. Of course, when you get to the Easter vigil Saturday night, we're ready for Jesus to come out of the tomb. But there's this one little service that we do here. Sometimes I do it out in the memorial garden if it's a nice morning. And it's actually very, it's very quiet as it should be. And the, then with the vigil, gives you how, how to light the pass, all the words you're supposed to say with the lighting of the Paschal candle, tells you that thing that we chant, if you've ever been to the Saturday, that service, what we chant going in and then gives you all the readings that you can do. We tend to do about four of them, but you can pick whichever ones you want out of this list. And then tells you when you're supposed to hit the lights. It, the rubrics tell you when you can have the sermon. Also tells you what to do if you have a baptism that day. And if you don't have a baptism, what you're supposed to do. Then speak, and then after all those liturgies of the day, we suddenly get into last week's topic, the sacraments. And who remembers last week's, what are the two, what are the two major sacraments for those who've either watched the tape or were here last week? <laughs> baptism and communion. That's right, baptism and communion. All right. So of course we assume baptism is the first thing that happens to us. So you say concerning the service. So here's where the prayer book lets you know that how and what you're supposed to do. So we know that holy baptism is the full initiation by water and the Holy Spirit into Christ's body, the church, and that it's indissoluble. Remember I said during about the sacrament of baptism, that it had to be in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to be valid in the Episcopal church. So that if you were baptized only in the name of Jesus, the Episcopal Church doesn't recognize your baptism. If you could be baptized in the Roman Catholic Church because or Lutherans, Methodists, even Baptists, as long as the Trinitarian formula was used, that baptism is, in our opinion, valid and indispensable. Is that, is, is that the way it was always that it always was, or is that more recent? What the baptism was had to be? No, it's always been. No, that recognized by the other denominations. If it's done in the in the name of the Trinity, um, I'd have to go and think about that. The Episcopal Church has always been fine with it, as long as it was. Mm -hmm. So it's probably around the Chicago land of Quadrilateral, which we'll look at also. Um, mm -hmm. It the holy baptism is appropriately administered within the Eucharist, so that's why, according to this prayer book. I'm not really supposed to do just bring your family anytime you feel like at baptisms. Now, as Erica knows, having a child that was ready to be baptized in the height of COVID, some rules had to be adapted. And thank you. And it, it worked out fine. It was a wonderful, beautiful event for Fabian. And it was also nice because it made it even easier for because Erica comes from a combined religious family and her husband's family are all Jewish. So we were able to let them experience the service and talk about, we can even talk about a little about what we were doing. I think, didn't we, do we incorporate some level of something out of the Jewish tradition in it? Or am I- Yeah, thinking? in that it was the High Holy Days at the time. Okay, so there was there was something that was nice about, and we made an yeah. acknowledgement of it, that's yeah. right. I remember we did something. So we know that it's supposed to be in the middle of the Eucharist. So when people go, why do you keep baptizing these kids and taking up our pew space? <laughs> <laughs> well, because the prayer book tells us that it's not really technically supposed to happen as a private event. This is a new thing for the Episcopal. This is a 79 edition. It used to be just bring the baby whenever you'd have a very private baptism, just the parents, godparents wasn't a big deal. But we, because we are saying in baptism, that child is now a member of the church. The church needs to be present. And we and, even have a prayer for that, right? Don't we? Oh yeah, to, we we was... receive you into the household of God. We can, and we'll look at that in a second. Mm -hmm. uh, if the bishop were here and I had a little baby, if somebody said, I'd love to get the baby baptized on October 16th, I'd be like, well, this is a great day. Not only will we have confirmations and receptions, we'll have a baptism because the bishop is there. But I'm a let the baptism. 
he has precedence if he's there, but it's I'm the next in charge of doing it. And, but a deacon can do them, and we'll look at that in a minute. In the absence of the bishop, priest does it because when I go to renew my ordination vows, they give me a nice new batch of holy oil. So that's the bishop's connection is the whole, the oil that I anoint baby's head with. He's blessed that oil. The questions get asked if a bishop baptizes a baby and was the one leading the, um, or a young child, has that child technically been confirmed? Do they need to go through for confirmation if they said their vows in front of a bishop? It's a deeper, it's a deeper dive. And some would argue, no, if a bishop did the baptism, then they've done their act and the kids have been fully confirmed. I don't quite know how that works. Was there a time when um, baptisms and confirmations took place together or, or maybe that was Holy Communion and confirmation? Uh, and could, in the sure. Episcopal Church, I don't remember. They always seem to be, be separate acts unless a bishop was present. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and each baptism is supposed to be sponsored by one or more baptized persons. So as we call them, godparents, and as I often say to the parents of a young child, has to be, you need the, the person to be a sponsor needs to be baptized. And because of what you're asking that sponsor to say, that you wouldn't want a devout Hindu or a devout Jew, even though they are amazingly religious, to say they accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Even if it's on behalf of somebody else, you're asking them to make a public statement that is not true. And I wouldn't want to put a friend in that kind of predicament. But somebody has to sponsor a person for baptize, baptism. They have to be sponsored by somebody that is, in fact, baptized. So Erica, even though her husband is Jewish, her sons could be baptized because she's of the Christian faith. And they, as a couple, decided this would happen. But because she's baptized, that's the one person that needed to be there. And then she, I think you had some godparents as well, if I recall. We did. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. Sponsors of adults. And there's, you know, even if you are not an itty bitty baby, if you decide to get baptized as an adult, you still need a sponsor. And it, why when parents and godparents are supposed to answer the questions is because parent, I've had times when there were no godparents, just the parents. All right, let's look at the service a little deeper than that. So as we know, the, we, the service starts off looking like any other one. Then we get to the part where everybody's up at the font and sponsors present or, and candidates that they can speak for themselves do so if it's a little six foot long child or somebody who really is not making a <laughs> they're, they're not really make, saying it for themselves quite yet like i i think that one of my favorite baptism series was of a five-year-old and he literally he it was the funniest baptism i've ever encountered but I remember that one but he was not speaking for himself so he still had to be presented and the parents and godparents answer the questions on behalf of the child. And if you're getting confirmed, you're saying, I'm confirming what was said on my behalf when I was a little kid. And you can have more than one baptism on any given Sunday. Though generally, we haven't had that happen too many times. Then the congregation, this is where the congregation gets involved because we say, we're witnessing this and we're going to try to uphold that family as they try to do what they just promised to do. And we say the baptismal covenant, which has the Apostles' Creed, which you will recall from our first class about creeds. And we say some nice prayers for the candidate. Then the water gets blessed. And we do the pouring of the water over the head. There was something, if I'm not mistaken, wasn't was there something about pouring the water when it's being blessed it, it's something like it had to be running water or something like that no not really not. no okay it, Sorry. It, it's it's a, it's a lot nicer when you can have a constant flowing water i mean being baptized in a river or an ocean is pretty cool 
but that's what I thought it was when you pour the water into I'm the, pouring the water. It's a symbol. That yeah, it, yeah. It doesn't become holy until I say words over. It's still water. Yeah. It's when I get to the now sanctify this water. So, but I like the symbolism water. though of it being supposed to kind of yeah, like, it's remind me of the in and becoming going from one vessel to another is very it's moving to say, okay, here's yeah. the sound of the rushing water, but it doesn't get blessed while it's rushing in. No, no. I just thought that was part of it. Yep, that you have, there's our Trinitarian language that we have to have. Then we say a prayer together. I then put the oil on, saying that they're marked as Christ sown forever. Then we get to the let us welcome the newly baptized. And this is where the whole congregation joins in, saying, we receive you into this. And here's the things that we do. And then the service goes on. Then we, confirmation and reception or reaffirmation, which are the things hopefully, one of these three is what you all are hoping for. And we'll figure out that when we get towards the end of the classes, which one you're doing. And the bishop has to be present for that. I don't do confirmations or receptions or reaffirmations. That's the bishop's job in the Episcopal church. If you were in the Methodist church, Methodist pastors do the confirming. Roman Catholic bishops, I think they do the confirmations. I don't think priests do. No, the bishop does. And I remember. the bishop says, you know, these these words, and each bishop does it their his or her own way. Each one's unique. Though I I tend to stand next to the bishop and feed them. Hi, you're now looking at this person, so they don't have, or the kit person has a card in front with the name printed out because the bishop is never going to have a shot at remembering who that was without a hint. <laughs> And there are different prayers for that, and then it goes into a, the usual communion. Then, speaking of communion, as we said, we have right one and right two, which is basically mostly about language. But let's take a look at a right two service and talk about, as we said, second most important sacrament because Jesus himself instituted it for us. And we know that the flow of the service generally happens the same way every Sunday. The rubrics again tell you when you're supposed to and gives you sometimes choices. Tells me what to say, tells you how to respond. Tells you when to stand and when to kneel. Then it has the prayers of the people, which as we know, has about six different forms in right to, but there are things that you always have to pray for. The church, the nation, the welfare of the world, the concerns of the local community, those who suffer or in any kind of trouble and for the departed. So if you look at all the different forms, you will find there's some specific prayer for all of that. The confession of sin is supposed to be said all the time. But it can't, no, it says it can be admitted. So if I feel like not confessing your sins that week, I could just skip it. I don't, I always figure we've done something stupid during the week. So we probably ought to go right ahead. And you say the peace, then it gets into the communion. Communion looks the same. We know, we all know this. It hits what's called a proper preface. So if you notice, sometimes if you're holding the prayer book, I keep saying stuff and you're like, what is he saying? That's the proper preface. And those change seasonally. Okay, then we have the Sanctus that everybody sort of knows. Then we have what, then we sort of recite the history of how we got to where we are. And then we get to the part where we remember what Jesus did, how when he's instituting the Eucharist, here's my body, here's my blood. Everybody says something together. Then here, here's the key word, sanctify. So it becomes the body and blood of Christ when I say sanctify by your Holy Spirit. At, up to that point in, in our brains, it's bread and wine. Our taste buds are still gonna tell us it's bread and wine, by the way, when you eat it, which is if you recall when we did the sacraments, we said the difference between transubstantiation and consubstantiation. Consubstantiation means we're changing its essence, but not its substance. 
And then we also ask that we get sanctified. So if you've ever watched me, when I say sanctify us, I do that. In the Episcopal Church, this falls under that rule of everybody can, some will, no one must. So if you were to look around at St. Luke's, there are people doing it all the, at the times that, it's, that, they, that you think they should. There are people who wouldn't do that if you paid them. And some <laughs> wondering, am I supposed to be doing something? It works always. And the thing about any kind of act like action like that is it has to be your comfort level. There is no right or wrong, but don't do it because your neighbor's doing it. Do it because it makes sense to you to do it. And there's a lot, lots of examples of that. And that's the beauty of Anglicanism is there, it's a big enough tent that you can see, occasionally you'll see people with their hands up like this in an Episcopal church. Mm -hmm. They also see things where those hands would never go up that way, no matter what was going on. But I always say to folks, if you want, if you're, if the spirit's moving you to put your hands up, put your hands up. But if the spirit's not moving you to do that, even if everybody else around you is doing it, don't do it. You're just being a, a lemming then and following what, the crowd and not letting the spirit move you. We then distribute communion. Tells me what I'm supposed to say, gives us the prayers, and on we go. Now, communion under cer special circumstances. So there are times you can have communion when somebody can't be present at a public celebration of the Eucharist. So when I take communion out to somebody, there's a service I should be doing with them. So if I'm visiting somebody in a hospital or shut in in their home and cannot for any reason come out. This is a service that if I wanted to do a full service with them, I would do. Like when our Eucharistic ministers go out, they do a full this with those folks. I'm there also to have a visit with them, bring them up to date on what's going on in the church and hear what's going on in their lives and we get communion. But there is a way you're supposed to do it. And then it gives you the things you have to do if you're trying to create your own service, though the Episcopal Church on Sunday mornings doesn't want you doing this. This is if I want to be creative on a Thursday. I could, here's what I have to have in anything I create. And there are some people who don't care that you're not supposed to do this on Sunday. They do it anyway. And said, we got all kinds of different forms and ways of ending it. Then we get to the pastoral offices. And again, most of these are the sacraments that we talked about. Confirmation tells us about the service, a form of commitment to Christian service. If somebody said, I feel I have a ministry not, that's not ordained, there's a service to, that the prayer book gives us to do that. And the celebration and blessing of marriage. So again, the prayer book tells us what an Episcopal wedding is supposed to look like. There is some flexibility in it, but there's not a ton. Though in my old age, I'm getting a little more flexible. The things that I think are interesting in it. Oh, go ahead, Dottie. I see your hand. Um, I'm curious. Uh, I know it's a small thing, but what is the significance? You know, and growing up in the Catholic Church, we did a lot of standing and sitting and kneeling too. But I don't know the significance for each of those actions. You know, when where they happen in the in the service and why well the standing is supposed to be you're in praise the kneeling you're in prayer and the thing about when the episcopal church says you can stand or kneel it what it really wants you to do it will say first so those little things called mm -hmm. rubrics if you're reading the prayer book it says the congregation stands or kneels it's giving you the individual a choice but it really wants you to stand. And if you're, and I notice you have lately added the words, if, if you are able. Because we're trying to be, even though at the creed you're supposed to stand, if literally standing is almost impossible, why do you want the, it's, it's an acknowledgement to those with disabilities. Okay. It's trying to be more welcoming. Okay. We're trying Thank to be acknowledging the fact that there are literally some some of our senior citizens 
And if somebody was wheelchair bound, they're not going to be standing up. Obviously can't stand or kneel. Yeah. Right. So, okay. So that's mostly it's to not make people feel like, oh my God, I'm doing it totally wrong, even though there's no way I could even conceivably do it. Mm -hmm. So if you remember when we were talking about the sacrament of marriage, I asked these, these two questions. Remember that we say into this holy union, the people uh, named now come to be joined if anyone can show just cause why they may not also be married. Speak now or else for hold your peace. Everybody knows this, this line because they have something in every soap opera wedding. <laughs> this and this is and this all somebody always interrupts the service right at this point. Or if you watch the graduate with Dustin Hoffman, mm -hmm. oh, he tried to break in there at that at this moment in that wedding scene. But nobody in my father's 50 plus years of being a priest has, or almost 60 now, has ever objected at a wedding when that is asked. There's goofing around at wedding rehearsals with it, but you do have to pause because it's a, it's a binding question because it's a legal question. It's not if, oh, I love you so much, I can't let you go even though we broke up 18 years ago kind of deal. There's a reason for it because the language cannot lawfully be married. So if somebody came and said, these said to me, uh, I object and here's why. The only objections that matter is that one of the two is already married because bigamy is illegal in the United States. Or two, that is not Tom Jones up there. <laughs> They're trying to come into a legally binding contract under false pretense. So again, your high school sweetheart can't come running up the aisle professing their love. It's irrelevant. But then we asked the couple if they know any reason. And my father has had somebody bail then. And again, it's you get one last shot to get out of this before you enter into what's supposed to be hopefully a lifelong commitment, though, as we know, it doesn't always work out that way. And rarely, and I've never had anybody say no, but the one time it happened for my father, the bride got courage at the last possible moment. Her parents were really saying, we paid $10,000, you're going through oh, well. oh. And she probably saved herself from a life of absolute misery. So, you know, courage, courage sometimes can happen. And then we get through that whole service and it tells us, and right now, I mean, within the Episcopal Church, this right now is the hottest topic around prayer book revision, because as you know, the Episcopal Church right now does do same-sex marriage. Yeah. We have a service that was created to do them. We don't just do this service and change the language. But the fight is, that, remember what I said at the beginning, the prayer book tells you what we believe. So one... So the argument is, if it's not in the prayer book, why are we doing it? But of course, we're doing it because we prayed about it, we've studied it, and we believe this is where the Holy Spirit's moving us. But for folks who aren't so sure about this, and they still are a few people in the Episcopal Church who aren't so sure, the thought of it being suddenly in the prayer book means, oh my God, we have to do this except the canons of the church say, I don't have to do a single marriage that, at all. I, as a priest, can refuse to marry anybody. I don't have to do that. Then the next pastoral office is a, the thing after marriage. It's interesting, it go, the services go, and we can have a blessing of a civil marriage. So if, if you got married in front of the mayor of Metuchen and then said, you know, God was somehow missing from this, it was a lovely service, but we feel like we don't, we're a little incomplete. You can come and get that civil marriage blessed. And that was one of the stepping stones when same sex marriages were beginning to happen was when first, because remember civil unions became a thing first before legalized quote unquote marriages. The marriage language was the big, bigger fight. And it tells you what things that you have to do, et cetera. 
then it assumes the next thing would be if you've been married, you'd have a birth of a child. There's a service that if before they get baptized, you just wanted to give thanks for the child, there's a service for it. And we have the reconciliation of penitent, one of those minor sacraments that again, remember I said con confession, we do it every Sunday, covers a general kind of sweeping things done and left undone. But if you ever really messed up in such a way that you can't sleep at night, you would come for this service. This is where language like seal of confession comes in. If you tell me something under the reconciliation of a penitent, I can advise you, you might want to turn yourself into the cops or any re or forgiveness maybe not be as valid. I'm supposed to offer counsel of what's the next right step. The only place where I can potentially violate the seal of the confession is under cases of child abuse because there's state law that says everybody has to report that. So if a child molester comes to me and confesses, I might be able to reconcile, but I have to be on the phone with the, with the police about that. And we get to the ministration of the sick, that unction sacrament that we talked about, because it assumes that somewhere in your adult life, you're going to get sick and maybe want specific prayers from the church. There's a ministration at the time of death. Roman Catholics would call that last rites. That's not what the Episcopal Church calls it. But there's specific prayers that we say. And then there's the whole burial of the dead service, which in the concerning the service would remind us that this is an Easter celebration. We're celebrating the resurrection. We're not, we acknowledge the grief, but we celebrate the life. And it tells us how we're supposed to bury our dead. And there's even a service for the burial of the dead for those who don't profess the Christian faith. So if somebody who wasn't a Christian for some reason, their family wanted me to bury them, there was a liturgy set up so that I can do that without saying words that don't are not in, wouldn't make any sense in the context. Then we have what are called Episcopal services, which are those ordination rites that are, again, a sacrament that I said really probably only one person in the room might ever have in their life. Potentially that'd be Giovanni, but I don't know that's where his life will take him. But I've had two of them. I and I'm probably done it too. I'm, I know I've done it too. <laughs> I will never be a bishop. But it's interesting that they put the rites in the, they make the bishop's ordination first, then the priest ordination, and then the deacon's ordination. The services themselves, lay out the same and hopefully you all will get to see an ordination of a bishop at least on on uh the internet because in june of 2023 we will have a new bishop and there'll be a hopefully a big service that everybody can either go to or at least watch they're always very impressive but to be ordained a deacon you need just a bishop and two sponsoring and a sp and two sponsors so much like baptism, ordination needs sponsors. So like right, like right now, Rosalie from our parish, who's, going, who's in seminary, hopefully graduates in um, 2024, would be, I would be her sponsor. I'd be one who'd stand up and say, we think this person would, is going to be good. She has to be ordained a deacon because you can't become a priest before you're a deacon, but only bishops make deacons. Ordinations of priests, priests show up to make more priests, but the bishop still has to be present and at least one other priest. And then, but for a bishop, there has to be three bishops present to make a bishop. Priests don't make bishops. We, we vote on them and elect them, and so do laity. But the presiding bishop and two other bishops come together and they lay their hands in any other bishops that come circle around this person and create a bishop. It then tells us how to celebration of a new ministry. That happened. We've done that here when I arrived in December or December after I arrived. It's a great celebration where they hand, they hand me sort of keys to the building, even though I've had them for a while. 
they read a nice letter that says I'm empowered to be in charge and the bishop says this is your priest and if we were building a new church it shows us how to do the privilege shows us how to do that then it also gives us the Psalter which is the book of Psalms which you can get in the Bible but we have all of them it tells even gives you how to read it over a 30 day period come to morning and evening prayer and you'll do it but they're all theirs because we use the Psalms at every service. So sometimes it's more helpful to have them in the prayer book. And you have the catechism, which is again, that sort of Q and A. The word means just what it did in the Roman Catholic church. Mm. So again, if you wanna know what we believe about Eucharist and communion and all, you'd first off look at the service because what we pray is what we believe, but there's Q&A that touches all kinds of topics. And I, again, I invite you to look at it. Lil Deep tells you what we say about the Ten Commandments and defines them all. What do we say about sin and redemption? What do we say about God the Son? What do we say about the New Covenant? What do we mean when we say that? What are the creeds? What is the Holy Spirit? What are the Holy Scriptures? What is the church? What is ministry? Who are the ministers of the church? And this is just an interesting little side. The ministers of the church are lay persons, bishops, priests, and deacons. You folks are more important to this church than me or a bishop. This church doesn't function without lay persons. Mm -hmm. And you're you are listed first as the, mo as the ministers of the church. And it says what your ministry is. You're supposed to represent Christ and his church. How are you doing with that? Bear witness mm -hmm. to him wherever you may be. And according to the gifts given you to carry on Christ's work of reconciliation in the world and to take your place in life, worship, and governance of the church. So if you're a, an active lay person, you're supposed to be active in worship and actually taking a seat on the vestry <laughs> once in a while. It's an important ministry. And it tells you what a bishop's supposed to do. And all of it, they all start the same and then they get into specifics. What is a priest or a presbyter supposed to do? What's a deacon supposed to do? And what's our duty? And it tells us about what is our, how are we supposed to pray and what worship is and gives you some terms that you may have heard or not heard. Talks about the sacraments. And we, we use the, a lot of these when we talked specifically about them a few weeks ago. I like that all of this is in the Book of Common Prayer. You right. know, in the Catholic Church, um, the catechism was separate and still is separate. Yep, it's there to read. And then if you really get bored during the sermon, remember how I joked that there's the, uh, <laughs> the historical documents. So if you wanted to see what was the Council of Chalcedon, there it is. The Creed of As the Nations, which I if you remember I told you was the best definition of eternity, but it's not written in any way you'll ever understand it. <laughs> Gives you the preface of the first book of 1549, the Articles of Religion, which is what priests who are ordained in the Church of England had to subscribe to this. And it's fascinating to go and read because you you read some things and you're like, wow, then no wonder it's in historical documents because it says candles shouldn't be used. <laughs> and there's all kinds of interesting, it's an ancient, an older form of the catechism but a good chunk of it is not stuff we teach anymore. Did they feel that some of those things were too reminiscent Rome. of Catholicism? Rem yes, Rem absolutely. Okay. Other popish nonsense. Nonsense mm -hmm. says somewhere in here. Oh, purgatory. There's a good example. Oh, the there you go. Doctrine concerning purgatory, pardons, worshiping, and adoration, as well as images as of relics, and also invocation of saints is a fond thing, vainly invented, and grounded <laughs> on no warranty of scripture, but rather repugnant to the word of God. Wow. Right? So that you can tell that at one time, Protestants really were ruling the roost, but there's a reason it's in the historical document section. <laughs> but again, some fun reading if you want to like a brief church history lesson, the tables for finding a whole holy days. Like if you wanted to say, when's Easter next year? And you didn't want, now, of course, Google will tell you fast. Mm -hmm. 
But first, there's a, a crazy math that you can do, or you can cheat like I would do and find that they've already done it for me. And so if I want to know, if you wanted to know right now when Easter Day was next year, I can tell you it will be on April 9th. If you want to make your vacation plans now. <laughs> but remember how I said it can be very early or very late? Notice how one it can be in March. It never gets to May. <sighs> but it's usually late March to mid-April. And it's all based on the lunar calendar and there's you know there's a fancy mathematical thing you can do to get it or you can just go to the table where it tells you i think going to the table that tells me it's a lot easier and it tells you when and because as i said a lot of things are based on when easter is remember i said there could be six sundays in epiphany or four it's based on when easter is ash wednesday has to be five weeks before easter plus a couple of days so that'll tell you when Ash Wednesday is. It tends to always be in February. Ascension Day has to be a certain day based on when Easter is. Same thing with Pentecost and the number of propers. Like when we say, remember when I said it was the collect of proper 16? That's because we've now had, it was the 16th Sunday, except if you look on the hymn board, it says Pentecost 11. So it's Pentecost 11 because it's, been 11 day Sundays since the Feast of Pentecost, but you have to start based on when that Pentecost is to look at what the collect is. So it can, depending on the day, change. And sometimes you, like in, when you're reading the lectionary, you go, why did we skip so much in the beginning? I feel like we jumped into the middle of a story. Well, yeah, you actually you did because you didn't read three or four weeks that weren't part of the year because Easter was late. Then if you wanna know what I'm supposed to be reading, here's what, if you wanna get a head start and not wait for the e-news blast to tell you, every liturgical year, it will tell you what the readings are supposed to be. So you could get a jump start. It tells you what the holy days are, what the readings are. So that's your lectionary. And it also tells you the same thing for morning and evening prayer. So as I said, the prayer book, the things to remember about is, this is what unites us as Episcopalians and Anglicans across the board, is a sense of common prayer. Not this particular book, but a book of common prayer in its specific context. All tied into the Church of England, and the one that we use here in the United States is called the Book of Common Prayer 1979 edition. And as you just found out tonight, has pretty much everything you could ever need to worship in the Episcopal Church, in addition to just doing your own private prayers at home. So any other that questions? That was going to be my quest My next question was, yeah. um, the, the Book of Common Prayer 1979 is used throughout the United States. Yes. But, and that's the Episcopal version. But if you're Anglican and say, the UK or in Africa or something like that, they might use something different. Yes, exactly. They have their own prayer book based on their branch of the Anglican community. There was a time, I think it was in the in in a summer that when Father Jonathan was here, that we used um the New Zealand prayer book, which was right. kind oh. of interesting. They're not very they're not always very different, but that was it was kind of interesting to see, you know, it was just a for a seasonal thing that he did one summer. Yeah, there are people that like to play loosey-goosey with the rules. That's playing loosey-goosey with the rules. Nobody's going to bust his chops about it because mm -hmm. in the grand scheme of things, does that really matter? Probably mm -hmm. not. Technically, though, if you wanted to nail him, he violated his ordination vows, and he could be charged. Nobody's going to waste their time with that. Mm -hmm. You're not technically supposed to do it and doesn't actually interest me, which is why I never do it. But some, I have colleagues that love to do that kind of stuff because they think this book is boring. I find this book mm -hmm. underutilized by them. Well, after everything you've shown us, I think you're probably right. There was a lot of stuff in there that I didn't even, that, well, that I didn't know about. Yep. Erica, I think that you had your hand up. 
Yeah, I had a question similar to Dorothy's about um, in 1979, when the U.S. The Episcopal Book of Common Prayer was most recently adjusted, did it did the centrality of the Eucharist versus, say, the centrality of morning prayer, which would have been more emphasized before, render the U.S. branch of the church different, more different from, say, the Church of England? Or has the Church of England also had a similar evolution? England has had its own sort of liturgical renewal, but the Episcopal Church was really influenced greatly by a lot of Vatican II, mm. Catholicism. But, but the Church of England was not? The Church of England, very little. Because again, the Church of England is always, has always been much more Protestant. The Catholic side has always been a smaller group. And that group of high churchmen came over here. And there's still pockets of really what's called Anglo-Catholicism, which looks a lot like pre-Tridentine Roman Catholicism. And it's, did that all take a, did that all take place that that leaning toward Vatican II did that all take place around the time of Vatican II which was yes all, all of the need, all of the movement towards this book began in the 60s okay the, the priests that were cutting their teeth at seminaries in the 60s were already beginning to head this direction and yet priests, at the same time sorry mm -hmm. go ahead Maybe this is coincidental or maybe there is some sense to it all, but the U.S., the Episcopal Church in the U.S. is in many ways more liberal, more progressive than other branches of the Anglican Church around the world. So while Absolutely. you have this move toward a more Eucharistic mm -hmm. and maybe a more traditional, the right word, way of worshiping, there's also been a much more progressive way of living or yeah, how, does, we are, how does that all come together? If it does. How does that all come together? <laughs> because our, because we... I think in us breaking really away from England. So like when issues around human sexuality, which are still fought on a bigger global level, the bishops in the two thirds world are like, your missionaries brought us this, told us this was the word of God and the 1662 prayer book is what they know. And again, mm -hmm. because we're, it develops in its own cultural context, which is what I always have to remind people, you know, the United States and Nigeria are two very different countries. It doesn't mean that one's better or worse. We are very different. Nigeria mm -hmm. has, has a different fight going on. They have Muslims leaders, conservative Muslim leaders, kicking down doors of churches and hauling priests off to jail. That doesn't happen here. So, when you have a conser very conservative theocracy of a dip that's not Christian and who has very specific beliefs about human sexuality, us saying to the rest of the world, you ought to be as good as us is not really helpful to them. Then telling us we're horrible sinners isn't really helpful to us either. If we could each learn to say, you know what, we understand your context is different. How about we all let each other move at our speed? And we're all still in communion with one another? Oh, we had, we've never said we're not in communion with anybody. They've said they're not in communion with us, but, the re but apparently we're still in communion with the only thing that seems to unite us, the Archbishop of Canterbury. It's, and it's very complicated because our church's history follows the Episcopal, the American history. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we talk about the Episcopal Church as a structure and governance, I'll show you the parallels very clearly. Now, Ed, the, the right one is, cl is closely related to the 1662. Yeah, it's pretty much the 1928 for our language, but it oh. goes much more out of 1660. 28, 79 really brought in modern, quote unquote, modern language, whatever that would mean. Okay. But I mean, now there are people saying this is this is still antiquated because it's so gender specific. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's another fight. We need more inclusive language in our talking about God or talking about humanity. Universal man language no longer flies in many circles to say all men mm -hmm. doesn't always sit well. And mm -hmm. even though you can say, well, we're not just talking about males. Well, 
yeah, yes and no. Yes, intellectually, I can understand that, but my brain sometimes hears men and I don't always think women if I hear a word. And when is the when is the new newer prayer book? Expected? Well, that's the point. There's people that say, why do we need to make a new book? Keep this old book and give other give other rights, give other pro- liturgies the same status without having to create a new book that everybody needs to buy. And as we go into online stuff, and you know, there's this is where we get ourselves all kind of jumbled and mumbled because we have sit there and go, we care about the environment. What are we going to do with all these old books? Mm-hmm. You know, how many trees do you want to kill to make books if you're, you know, the sacredness of creation trying? It is. Sometimes we trip over ourselves trying to do the right thing. And mm-hmm. we, but we try to muddle through it together. And that, mm-hmm. that's the thing, as I said, somehow this book or the essence of this book unifies us as Anglicans across the world. We don't agree on many things, but around this seems to be a, a central reasonable unifier, a sense that we have common prayer. Mm-hmm. And But it gets stretched. I think that, that was one of the things that I really appreciated when I first became an Episcopalian after having been in the the Catholic church for so long is that everywhere you went in the Roman Catholic church, there was a different missile, a different prayer book Um, or not a prayer book at all. Maybe just a little pamphlet with the prayers for that particular week or or day. Whereas in the Episcopal church, I could go into any church. Um, I remember uh, up in North Jersey going into, when I first started going to the Episcopal Church, going into the church during the the mass and we were kind of late. And I walked into, got into the pew and there was a fellow next to me and he handed me his prayer book, which was open to the right page and then took another one and opened it up. But it was like, you know, and I think that had a lot to do with the the commonality. Of the, of the Episcopal Church, that everything was the same. And I really I really liked that. Yeah, generally you should be able to go into any Episcopal Church in any state in this country and feel at home mm. for the most part. There'll be differences, but service itself should look an awful lot like, like what's happening at St. Luke's. Mm-hmm. From time to time, again, priests have their own different styles. Some. But for the most part, there's a, there's an outline that has some level of flexibility, but has is not totally porous. All right, and on that, any other last questions? If not, oh, go ahead, Eric. Yep, it's really a short one, a technical one. During the, the Eucharist, we hear the names of two different bishops: our bishop and our presiding bishop. Yes. Which one is our bishop and which uh, one is coming okay. in October? Chip, Chip, Chip R. Bishop is the bishop of New Jersey. The presiding bishop is the bishop of bishops. So he's the head, he is the archbishop uh, that we don't call him, that we call him the presiding bishop. He oh. gets voted on by the other bishops select him for every nine years. So right now he's a man named Michael Curry. If you watch the last royal wedding, he was the yeah at the last royal wedding wow so michael curry is sort of a rock star in yeah. <laughs> most of us would say michael curry has one sermon <laughs> it, and well, we've and all heard it much. over and over again mm. but he's also a very dynamic preacher so you let him go on the fact that he just said the same thing again <laughs> so but chip is the one that we're talking about yeah, when we chip, chip will chip stokes the bishop of new jersey will be here in October. Okay. And he's the one that we're now also getting ready to elect his successor. So there's a whole search committee looking at bishops and come January, we're, that's when we'll vote. And you'll send your delegates and I'll go vote and whoever wins and it don't, I'm gonna go 73 to one odds that it'll be a woman or a person of color. I feel fairly certain that it will not be a straight white male. I could be wrong about that, but I, the last election when Chip was elected, the runner up was a woman and it was close. And third place was an African-American male. 
So I'm guessing that New Jersey is going to go the direction that the church itself has done a lot lately. There's literally been slates of bishops that there's not a straight white male to be seen. Mm. And I'm like, wow, okay, the pendulum has really swung. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing, but lousy for people like me. <laughs> <laughs> it means we're, we were untimely born. Wrong generation for this. But a good thing for those of us who believe this is the right direction to go, that there should. But at Lambeth that just finished, this recent Lambeth, there was a picture of 90 women bishops in the whole Anglican communion. Three. Um, what would it have been about 20 years ago, there were 10 in the entire world. And most of them were either Episcopalians or Can Canadians. So to think about that, the breadth of the, that many women. Wow. And of course, the Episcopal Church brought in openly gay and lesbians into the picture. And that's, that's not quite as comfortable for some in the Anglican communion as women are. But that's now the next group. You'll start to see that expand. But the days when the House of Bishops, look, everybody looked like me, except older, are over. Which is, I think there's a part of us, many of us going, who'd want this thankless job? Honestly, it's a big headache. But it will be interesting to see. And the nice thing is, is all of you have an indirect say into who the next bishop is. You get to ask questions, and the people that St. Luke sends as its representatives, you vote who they are. Mm -hmm. So that's a di another big difference about Episcopalians that we'll cover in September, is how we govern ourselves and what makes us a little different from the other denominations. But well, that reminds me, when's our next meeting? The next one will be September. The We're going to meet the 8th and the 22nd. Eighth. So we'll have two more. Okay where we're gonna cover basic, some basic church history and sort of firm up what everybody's wanting to do when the bishop comes. Okay. All right. Well, again, thank you for your t all your time. This ran a little longer. If there, you felt like you missed something, go back and watch the video. <laughs> thank you, Ed, it's, it was really good. Thank you. Okay, good night all. Hope to see you thank soon. You, Thanks, good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.